Good evening and good, uh, good night, everyone. This is update for April 30, 2022, day 66 of the war, end of the date update. So you, as you can see, it's, we passed two, uh, two months mark and it's unimaginable that this war is still going on. Just, just a side note. Let's start now with a strategic, uh, strategic update. And then we're actually going to do, we're going to split strategic update into two parts. One that's going to look at the economy, and that's going to be the first part. And then the second part, which is going to look at the Donbass salient and Ukrainian strategy and Russian strategy and what might happen here, it's going to be the second part. But that we will embed into the frontline walkthrough just because it makes a lot of sense to explain first tactical situation there. And that, that helps to explain what may happen on the strategic level. So having said that, let's look at the uh, strategic, economic strategic situation in Ukraine. <laughs> and specifically, we're going to look at the situation with the fuel. So shortages of fuel are like getting worse by day in Ukraine. And this is obviously significant. The, the root cause, obviously, is Russian attacks, um, on the loco uh, locomotive depots in Ukraine. And then also they attacked bridge here in near Bilhard Dostrovsky <clears throat> that uh, was where um, supply of, of fuel was coming from Romania to Ukraine. So that was one of the major routes to supply um, fuel to Ukraine. So just for those who are not from the region, Romania has surplus crude oil it's been forever one of the major producer of crude oil. It has rich reserves. They're dwindling down by now, but it, they still have surplus. So they can supply extra. And at this point, Ukrainian refineries are all destroyed. And for that matter, essentially all of the industry is destroyed. So Ukraine, even agriculture is going to get destroyed if this war continues for long enough. So it, it essentially economic life in Ukraine is grinding to a halt as a whole picture. So Ukraine is importing not just crude oil, but actually diesel and gasoline <laughs> and jet fuel, obviously, for the airplanes, for the military airplanes. So we understand that Russia was attacking and all of that that creates problems. That's sort of normal expected in this situation. However, we mentioned many times that Ukrainian government and the special economic side is extremely inept, unprofessional, and I would say dangerous for the country itself. Well, in one of their videos, probably a couple of weeks ago, we discussed how Ukrainian government with its own hands suffocating natural gas production. In theory, Ukraine can be self-sufficient in natural gas and not dependent on Russia, but the industry was essentially destroyed by government regulation and excessive taxation. So this is exactly why there are the shortages happening this time again. So it's a country is definitely shooting itself in the head. And there is a, um, there is a person there, his name is Daniil Hetmanov, who is kind of like an economic czar for the president and he's kind of like economic um, ideologist and he believes in uh, total regulation control higher taxes you know typical actually um, we would say communist approach to things um, or dictatorship type of approach so he's obviously practicing that and what he did he, he basically pushed the idea that government regulates price of gasoline and diesel fuel. And so they set the price that is below current international market price for gasoline. Right. So what that means is, for example, the traders who distribute or distributors who distribute the gasoline and diesel fuel across the country the price that they have to sell to the retail customer is below wholesale price that they, at which they purchase from abroad. So as you can imagine, nobody's going to be working to lose money. So 
they all shutting down because they don't want to lose money. Very logical action from their side. And then yet it's portrayed in the country as by, you know, sort of local propaganda as, you know, these people are evil and they are causing the troubles while they actually, the trouble is being caused by this person, Daniel Hetmansev, who is pushing for, you know, the uh, price dictatorship and it never works. It always creates shortages. So that's, that's kind of the problem that Ukraine is finding itself right now. And what we hear from president, he's not trying to resolve the problem. He's saying, okay, people, please be patient. That's how it's going to be. So that that's even, you know, it tells us that it's, it's totally disastrous economic policy. And that's part of the reason why Ukraine is in such difficult situation as well, because it's shooting itself in the head. And furthermore, this person, Daniel Hotmansev, was alleged to be, um, to have ties and connection to the Russia and to Russian uh, special services. And basically that he might be working for their uh, being Russian spy. This is just allegation, but there is pretty good supporting evidence for that. So just to explain, so there used to be general in Ukrainian equivalent of KGB, which is called uh, SBU. And that general um, fled to Russia about uh, right before 2014 uh, revolution in Ukraine. And so he's been living there, very vocal, you know, against you know, Ukraine, you know, very pro-Russian and all of that stuff, right? So, and this person, Daniel Hatmansov, was actually aid. So that fled, that general that fled was uh, about four, served four terms in Ukrainian parliament. Mm, and this Daniel Hatmansov was served, was, was his aide and advisor during all of his terms in Ukrainian parliament. So as you can imagine, you will never, you know, you will never hire someone who is not the same views as you are. So, so this is really pointing to us that there is a lot of, pro this is again pointing to the issues that we said that there is humongous leakage from Ukrainian talk to, to Russian special services in all ways of life, not just, this is probably one of the examples how things got worse, unnecessary worse for no reason. Mm, but then this, you know, leads us to all of that leakage of foreign volunteers that are helping in Ukraine. And that's not, that is not an exhaustive list. A lot of those people, they are just um, basically, uh, they're not like fighters on the front line, but they're just helping bringing resources to Ukraine and so on. But it all tells you, and then we also have from, from the ground reports, we mentioned this before, that when Russian troops came to, let's say, Kyiv region, they had lists of all of the people who were serving in Ukrainian army in Donbass, and also all the people who signed up for Ukrainian militia. So they were kind of going door to door, seeking them out. And if they found them, some of them, well, some of them, most of them got executed. So this is the problem um, that's, that's plaguing Ukraine and not helping Ukraine fight this war, right? And so we think that if this approach, this people who are, doing tremendous harm to Ukraine, continuing power, um, there, there, this war will be very long and who knows what will happen at the end. So, so that, that they, these people basically put chances of Ukrainian survival and winning the war in terms of not losing, you know, ter territory and its independence under the question, under big question. So this is a situation with with the um, with the fuel shortage and why it's so acute and what happened to it. So now let's um, actually start with our let's move let's do a frontline walkthrough. As always, we're gonna do it in a clockwise fashion. Even though some people wanted to do in 
counterclockwise fashion. We're not sure why, but uh, you can skip if you're really looking just at the situation uh, in Herson and McLeod region. You can just skip towards the end. And let's look at the situation uh, in Har around Kharkiv. Here we are learning that Russian uh, side launched counter attack to recapture Ruska Lozova, which was captured yesterday by Ukrainian side. At the same time, Ukrainian side managed to squeeze a little bit more Russian troops here uh, and um, uh, um, capture another village here. I think it's a Verkhnia Rogovatka, if I remember correctly. And this whole situation tells us that it's clearly that Russia here on strategic uh, defensive. And that's actually, now let's look at the situation uh, at the Zoom bridgehead. And actually, we're going to have a few comments about that. So we're hearing a lot from the Russian sources that Ukrainian side is preparing major offensive um, to, uh, to cut off uh, a Zoom bridgehead and that the Ukrainian side is even bringing um, building pontoons bridges here straight like kind of like uh, vast of a zoom in addition we're hearing this is from ukrainian side that russian uh, russian side is putting kind of creating straw holes in this whole area by putting russian detachments all over to create to basically in in case there is offensive so that those strong holes supposed to stop that offensive and will prevent from cutting off troops on the Zoom bridge head. So this is kind of sinking on both sides, both sides. So, well, on the Russian side, mostly we, you know, we're not sure if Ukrainian side is really trying to do major offensive. As we mentioned before, offensive is much more difficult than defense. And Ukrainian army is not there for many, many reasons. And we probably will discuss eventually all of the you know reasons why it should not do it, it probably will end in sort of tears. And <clears throat> but that's what. But the Russian expectation is that Ukraine is preparing co a counteroffensive here. So let's actually look at the situation. There's no there are no changes on the bridgehead itself, and we're actually learning a little bit more about the fighting on the bridgehead and how everything is happening. So actually, the Russian side didn't change the strategy much. So they're not controlling the whole, like, if you look at this, it doesn't seem like Russian troops control the whole of this bridgehead. They don't. So what's happening is they essentially controlling these major roads. That's where they con uh, concentrated. They, you know, they stay in the villages along these roads. And that's where the majority of them, where they are, so there's huge amount of gaps here. So there is no contiguous front line, as we discussed many times. So that creates, and that actually, then with that's being exploited by Ukrainian side. And what they do, they send mobile groups, basically, let's say four, four people, eight people on either one SUV or even buggies. There were reports from the Russian side that the Ukrainian side is using even buggies. And then they send those mobile groups. And if you see, probably not very well, like visible here, but it's the whole area has like small patches of woods everywhere, right? Like you see here, see here. So those are in the ridges. So it's kind of like, like ridges and small patches of wood and then like big fields. So like, so that creates opportunities for this for this mobile groups that and they and they usually well not usually like they always have and and they tank um, rockets with them or uh, well yeah rockets and so what they go they hide in those patches of woods let's say one kilometer or even two kilometers away from the main roads and then they shoot at Russian moving um, tanks or or BMPs or whatever, any um, vehicles that the Russia employs there. And then they sort of, you know, destroy one or two, and then they just move around. So that really creates uh, permanent tension for the Russian troops. And it obviously bleeds them uh, slowly, but, but surely of the main, you know, troops. And it, 
and um, and equipment, right? And there's, there's not just one group, right? There are many of them. So, and they go as far even as to here, South Sizum. So this, this whole area is totally not controlled by Russian troops. It's all like Swiss cheese, right? So, so they've been spotted even like Ukrainian groups, even like South of Izum right here. So what the Russian side is doing is kind of how the countermeasures that they do to, to fight against that is then they use this uh, special forces brigade here and probably there is more. We definitely know that this, like, let's say 99%, that this brigade, 24th brigade is here. There is also high chance, high probability, there is th a third special forces brigade. And this is basically, they unleash these brigades and they just go and, and hunt those mobile groups in the woods, right? So that's why sometimes you see Russian reports showing, oh, okay, here we destroyed some Ukrainian soldiers and you see like some destroyed equipment usually as some kind of SUV and then destroyed um, uh, anti-tank um, uh, rocket launcher. So that's exactly what happens. They, this special forces brigade, they go and hunt, try to, um, you know, protect the main troops. And let's say if they find Ukrainian group, then they usually immediately use uh, a lot of uh, artillery fire. So that it's total shelling and then they attack them. So they try to sort of encircle them, you know, pin them down first with artillery fire and then encircle them and then eliminate them. So that's how it works. So that's obviously creates significant losses on the Ukrainian side, but it also creates losses on the Russian side. So that's kind of like what's been going on here. And if we, if we think about this situation, it kind of really explains why the Russian troops even though they numerically probably you know outnumber Ukrainian side and specifically in equipment and artillery, which is the backbone of this war, really, and that's actually another topic that we need to discuss. So, for that reason, that kind of prevents explains why the Russian troops are so slow to move forward because their lines, even supply lines or anything like like even new troops, it's all always under threat. Right. And, and the, some, 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 you know, some tanks, some um, armor fighting vehicles, they're getting destroyed as they move to the front line. So for that, and that also, if you, we think more about this, if Russian troops try to even to expand this, um, this bridgehead, they will face with this problem even at higher magnitude, because then they need to defend even larger perimeter, if you think, or a larger territory. So they will need even more special forces brigades to cover it. And it's going to be harder and harder. So basically it's a, mm, kind of like, a, mm, how you call it, self-destructive process in a way. Because the more they, they advance, the more counter forces are being applied to them, the more they're being drained of their own resources. So that really mm, actually educates us. And this is just our you know, explanation, discussion, everybody welcome to chime in, chime in in the comment section. Now, why, that's why we're thinking at this point, if you look at this whole situation here, that it's, it's very doubtful that Russian side will be able actually to do encirclement here. That they will, that even that they will be able to, to move much further. Yes, they may actually move and cut off this this major supply route here that goes from Barvinkova to Slovyansk. But that, that still doesn't prevent, you know, supply of everything to Ukrainian side because there are routes to the south of it. So there's still, you know, it's not, uh, yeah, it's painful, but it's not the end of the world, so to say, for Ukrainian side. And if we actually also identified additional Ukrainian brigade here, 46 brigade, which from our understanding, it's not fighting. It's being, it's there in reserve. It's, it's actually te technical name is it's airborne brigade. Um, we never, we were not aware that this existed. This is our first time learning about it. So this actually tells you that there's a, a lot of Ukrainian troops. And even just to kind of cut through this, you need much more troops than Russian side has so far. So in our view, unless they somehow resurrect Kyiv West group in full force and Kyiv East group in full force. Uh, we doubt that this encirclement, this 
cutoff of the best salient is happening. Or they use some other resources equal to the Kyiv East and Kyiv West group. It just just the way it ha- it's going here, they don't have enough density of troops to really control the territory, and then they slowly getting destroyed by this uh, you know kind of guerrilla warfare attacks from Ukrainian side. It actually reminds very similar to what's been going on here in the Kyiv West and to lesser extent Kyiv East. So the same kind of tactic is being employed. And in this case, at least the terrain is somewhat supportive, less supportive than it was in Kyiv West, where it was all wooded here, at least. But there are patches of woods here, right, and ridges, which also makes it easier to hide and 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 and, and kind of run away after hitting. So, so that's kind of what makes us really skeptical at this point about you know Russia's ability to actually do this encirclement, even to to actually do major, you know, even like to get to, let's say, to this town of Pokrov, even to get to the half of it, like it may, they may do move another five, 10 kilometers, but it doesn't seem um, that they will be able to achieve what they want. So let's actually go back to where, sorry, um, let's go back to, um, let's look at, uh, go back to this map and let's look actually right now what's been going on on the Ukrainian bridgehead, uh, Liman bridgehead, which is the main town here, Liman. And some people were asking, well, what's the size of the town? It's a pretty small town. It's about 23,000 people before the war, obviously, right now it's probably half of the size. So it's nothing really major. And this whole bridgehead is that has no strategic um, importance, except it helps Ukrainian side to delay Russian troops. and you know, drain them of their resources. However, at this point, uh, the Russian, Russian, Russian side is obviously advancing. So we don't have any confirmation that the Russian side uh, captured Yampil uh, from independent one, let's put it this way, only Russian sources. But they do look more and more, I'd say, mm, plausible. So it does. So we put this that they destroyed. Uh, it's a third company of the 1st Battalion of 79th Brigade here. So basically, they didn't destroy the entire brigade. They destroyed probably about 70% of brigade, and then uh, 30% of them uh, surrendered. So that's kind of the situation there. Um, Then there is no major attack on Liman yet, because actually um, this village of Stavki is still in Ukrainian hands. That's what we're learning. And also, Ukraine still uh, controls Drobosheva, so they really need to kind of come from all sides before they be able to start um, uh, start attack major assault on Neman. <clears throat> also, Russian side is claiming that they already captured Krim Key here, so which is totally possible. We, we're not sort of there's nothing coming from Ukrainian side, but it's totally possible. So. Um, all we can say is this: this bridgehead is about is bound to be lost by Ukrainian side. It's just a question how quickly, and if Ukrainian side is able to inflict enough losses to make it worthwhile defending this this bridgehead. That's really what about it. There's also um, reports from the Russian side that about thousands of Ukrainian troops of identified unit were. Um, encircled somewhere near this Oskil, call it artificial lake, or we don't know how to call it in English properly, but basically around here on the eastern side, which is actually, if we go to the map, basically what they're claiming that this group was encircled somewhere here, which is totally impossible given the whole situation, that this group was actually preparing to launch counteroffensive it, this this whole story doesn't make any kind of sense because if this group is so far away from major Ukrainian troops, they would never launch any counteroffensive because they don't. And thousand, you know, thousand soldiers will never be able to achieve anything. So it really doesn't make any kind of sense. There's no any other confirmation of that. Like let's say captured, you know, so showing kept thousand captured Ukrainian soldiers or anything like that. So this really makes us saying that this is just a propaganda. Uh, unlike the situation with the 79th Brigade, where at least we see 
you know, soldiers on the Russian, they obviously pressure to say what Russian side wants to say, but at least we see those soldiers and they look credible to us, right? So, but, so that's at least we can kind of use as a confirmation for this. Okay, let's, uh, so hopefully we addressed all of these questions about this whole area. Let's now continue moving. We're going to look at the tip of uh, Donbass salient, specifically town of uh, Rubizhne, Severodonetsk. Then we're going to go a little bit south here and uh, look at the town of Popasna. Uh, as a heads up, there's nothing major happening here. Russian side is not even trying to so far actively assault Severodonetsk. They're still trying to squeeze out Ukrainian side from Rubizhne. And Ukrainian side obviously still holding on to the, you know, small part of the southern part of Rubizhne here. Uh, there's still fighting going on for the village of Orikhova, which was said before, Russian troops uh, controlling majority of it probably, but they don't have full control of the village yet. So that's really what's going on here. Now let's move a little bit south to, to Popasna. Again, the same story here. And the Russian side is now officially saying that they regrouping and preparing for new assault on Papasa. So basically what this really means is that they got exhausted with the troops that they had here and they need the pause, they need to regroup, they need to rethink how they're going to attack this and probably get more resources, specifically more infantry to support this. So that's, that's the situation here. So now we're going to look... Uh, to, on, at the front line, straight like straight west of Donetsk, where again, no changes, continuous attack on Avdiivka, Marinka, Novomikhailovka, without much of success. So the same kind of situation there. Now let's look actually um, at the situation uh, at the Zaporizhia front line. And we're going to first look at the eastern section of it here from town of um, uh, Velika Novosilka to Gulaipole here, because that's the uh, that's the area where Russian side is trying to build the southern pincer here, which we again skeptical because again they they using the same units that been here since the beginning, and yet they didn't fight as much. But we're pretty sure that they are not at the full strength. So obviously they still capable of fighting there's no question about it but this is not and this is just really well two divisions and they cannot just you know leave the entire front line you know undefended and send only two divisions here and that's still not going to be enough so it kind of tells us that there's not enough troops here to make deep penetration into you know into the south to the to going towards the north from the south so again this is actually makes us you know, skeptical again, even more that there's simply not even enough troops here in the south, because at least in the north, there is some amount of troops that at least enough for initial success. Here, there's not even enough troop to, troops to make any truly meaningful penetration. They did make some small ones. So let's actually look. They, they kind of created this wedge here initially, but now it's being uh, plugged by Ukrainian side. And it doesn't look like there is much of the progress anymore here. So this this seems to be in the check on the, from the Ukrainian side. And this is this wedge that we just discussed. And then we just see the same situation, just uh, straightforward attacks on strongholds, Arihiv and Hulaipole, that lead kind of to nowhere. So this this seems to be pretty much static in terms of front line and, and very low probability of Russian success in the long run here. Now let's actually move and uh, in terms of Mariupol, we just want to mention that there is still fighting going on there. We're not, we're not really discussing because there's not much to discuss here except for this units here from call it uh, Mariupol group is also out of action in our opinion, similar to Kyiv Ky West and Kyiv East groups. So the same, they, in our opinion, they will not be able to truly participate in, in this build, in 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 this thousand pincer because they 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 suffered pretty heavy losses there, and they still, in, in from even though we're hearing that they are not even there, they probably, be, they probably were taking back to the rear for refitting, you know, re replenishing and so on. So this whole front line is essentially now meant 
by the DNR troops here, by the uh, by the parts of the First Army Corps here. We don't know which uh, specific uh, brigades here or even regiments are doing that, but it's essentially the front line controlled uh, by the First Army Corps. So now let's look at uh, tor let's move towards the west and look let's look what's going on here in um, Kherson. Essentially, it's a Kherson bridgehead as we call them call it. So here we finally rebuilt this map a little bit. So no changes, the same static situation. <laughs> we just want to point out that we confirmed that there is kind of like a Russian bridgehead um, around a village of, of well, it's kind of like hybrid, kind of uh, hybrid between the village and a really small town, this Snehorivka. So Russian side keeps this for the future, just in case if they want to exploit and move forward. But so far, they are really on strategic defense here, as they need all of their resources for Izum. So this is uh, this is it for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. And uh, please comment. Uh, I, I will try to be more responsive. It was just a difficult day today. I couldn't really respond much. But I promise to respond and be engaged in the discussion. So um, just want to say, you know, ask your questions. And it helps really to drive this whole discussion because then I am able to see what people are, you know, most interested in, where there are confusions, where there are questions. So it really kind of helps to drive discussion in general. So again, thanks again. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.